now uh, start the recording uh, of the formal event. So again, um, uh, without uh, further ado, I will uh, introduce the UNESCO chair in uh, disaster risk reduction and resilience engineering. This was instituted in October, 2021 and runs in the first instance for four years. I'm supported at UCL by a team of three academic staff and three researchers. And we work in strict collaboration, both with the UNESCO Disaster Risk Reduction Division at, in Paris, headed by Soichiro Yosukawa, but also with a number of uh, partners across the world, which will you see manifesting themselves through this presentation. So our focus is, the, is uh, on school infrastructure. So why a UNESCO chair in disaster risk reduction should focus on school infrastructure? Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that everyone has a right to education and that education shall be free, le at least in the elementary and fundamental stages and should be also compulsory. I we all need to be educated. Um, the sustainable goals, uh, the 17 sustainable goals, among them, the, the goal number four also states that we should ensure inclusive and equitable quality of education to promote and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Quality of education is also recognized as a critical precondition to achieve many of the other goals, as we can see here. So this is uh, what, the reason why we want to focus on it, but there are several barriers to a better education quality, starting from uh, poverty to uh, challenging geography, from insecurity due to conflict to uh, the uh, problem with uh, uh, gender equality, from uh, poor infrastructures, to uh, uh, poor resources and uh, quality of education. As engineers, however, we can uh, influence at least the quality of infrastructures, and we want to do this in order to support and underpin the education delivery in a climate, in a, an environment, in a global environment where we are also affected greatly by climate change. The constraints to the quality of school infrastructures are identified by the Global Alliance for Disaster Risk Reductions in the uh, 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 in the uh, comprehensive school safety framework, and it also identifies several domains within which infrastructures should be. Uh, improved in order to perform and deliver good education quality. Such domains refers to safe infrastructures, to proper functional infrastructures, which allows sufficient space, adequate sanitary facilities in order to end durable infrastructures, i.e. Sustainab sustainability should also be at the far front of this process of improving uh, the um, uh, improving the uh, school infrastructures. So how the, uh, the UNESCO chair can uh, improve delivering in this area? The uh, chair activities build upon our previous projects, such as uh, the global program from, for school safety in collaboration with the World Bank and others many activities that we delivered in the past on disaster risk to resilience of schools. We have identified a large number of partners, as you can see at the top of this uh, slide, with, and we have four main objectives, to develop a multi-hazard holistic resilience engineering framework, to develop a system of data inventory for exposure, which is affordable and efficient, to create, very importantly, a culture of resilience engineering through the, uh, the delivery of open uh, source uh, educational resources and training activities, 
of which this is the first, and uh, leading to a sustainable networking, global networking through a permanent hub and a so-called community of practice. This will in, in turn deliver that climate change and disaster resilience schools that are needed and their associated uh, critical infrastructures. Um, in order to fulfill uh, uh, the first uh, objectives, we have a number of projects that we have uh, um, developing in collaboration with our uh, global partners. And I will not have now the time to uh, um, illustrate all of them, but very briefly, they are presented in the following slides, and I uh, exhort you to look at them uh, also on our website. For instance, this first project links the needs for infrastructure interventions, mainly related to structural uh, retrofitting with the availability of budget. So with the economics behind improving school infrastructures, considering the best allocation among different districts, for instance, or within an entire re uh, region, depending on the quality of the individual compound. A second project, it doesn't, doesn't want to progress. Sorry, yeah. A second project is uh, uh, looking at the many new schools in Nepal that have been built after the earthquake in 2015 to review their improvement, not only to the seismic safety, but also very important to functionality and quality of the learning environment. In, uh, in order to make education delivery resilience in time, we need to minimize interruption due to natural events such as flood and earthquakes. And besides making the school infrastructure resilience, we also need to make, for instance, the road infrastructures and the other services resilient that serves the schools. So in these projects, we look at the trade-off of investing, for instance, in school and roads, and how they can uh, interact and best uh, provide system resilience. Um, as I mentioned, flooding and storm surge are becoming increasing threats, not just for many uh, island nations. And this project looks at the existing vulnerability in uh, Sri Lanka or schools in Sri Lanka and how they can be uh, mitigated. In relation to uh, um, the second objectives, we want to use 3D uh, building data automated acquisition and extraction using machine learning and artificial intelligence. 3D models will allow us to build better exposure model with the, which in turn allows us to understand better the vulnerability at herb, to natural hazards and the value of intervention at urban level. In order to fulfill uh, the third objectives, we uh, are developing in collaboration with our partners, a repository of educational resources. As I mentioned, this is the first, but there will be others and activities that will promote and help implementing disaster risk reduction and resilience engineering in the field. We really want to the shift to happen from social and cultural resilience to how do we make this a technical endeavor, so resilience engineering. Um, this is the uh, um, program that we will develop during the, um, in the following months, and uh, we will uh, continue to develop uh, throughout the four years of the uh, chair tenure. Um, we will very much uh, look forward uh, to have your uh, suggestions in order to other possible uh, topics and uh, events that we should uh, organize. And please, as I said earlier, fill uh, the survey at the end of these sessions. Now, without further ado, I will leave the microphone to my co-presenters for the day, Professor Juan Francisco Correal and then uh, Rafael Fernandez. But before leaving, I would like to... Sorry, there is a problem with the... Yes, I would like to, you to join me in remembering Professor Luis Eduardo Yamin of Universidad de los Andes. Luis was an exceptional person 
very bright and full of energy. It was, he, he was behind much of the development of the Capra platform, but also he was a substantial and key contributor to the development of the disaster risk reduction agenda in the education sector from which and from the work that, to which we cooperated in the past years, the chair has developed. He was also a very dear friend. And with this, thank you very much for listening. And uh, I pass the mic to uh, Juan Francisco. Thank you very much, Dina, for, for this kind introduction. Uh, I will, let me, let me see if I can share now my screen. Um, okay, so Rafael, can you confirm if you see my screen, full screen? Yes, one. we are. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much, Dean, again for the for the introduction and for the invitation um, to to be here, you know, in, in, as as be part of the the partners of the UNESCO share and and, try, and also to share this uh, important uh, platform that that was developed in in the two thousand eight. Um, as as a platform to 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 help to 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 the probability risk assessment. So um, I'm gonna go through the presentation right now. Um, so, but I want to start my presentation with 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 actually with a recommendation of a book that uh, talk about ten reasons why we are wrong about the world and why things are better. Um, that we already think. Uh, so, so it's it's really a very good book, very positive, a positive book, and give you a perspective of the world that is different. That most of the news and, and things are getting now uh, 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 to us. So, so the, the question when I, I read this book was if if we can do even better that we are now, and I, I believe, I believe that we can, I believe that we can do better. So I, 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 I am, I'm bringing some question from the book here. Uh, so, so let you know that most probably, you know, some people who are, and I see this question and see, and see the possible answers are, are, are wrong, you know, because we have a wrong way to, to, to think that things are not too good. So for example, in this one, where does the majority of the world's population live? So, so most of the people are going to ask for, for A, but the correct answer is B, which is the middle income countries, uh, which is almost the 76 world population is living in these countries. So, 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 you know, so we're not too bad. We are, we are good. We are in, in, in a good way, in a, in a good road. Um, this other question, in the last 20 years, the proportion of the world's population living in the extreme poverty, so most of the people can answer probably A or even B, but you know the the the, the, the current the, the, the correct answer is C, Albert. So it is actually a, a, a reduction, which is something good, you know. So 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 we are in in a good way. The life expense expectancy in the world today. So. You know, in the past, most of the people will, will actually uh, answer A or B, but actually C. So, no, so people is living longer. You know, the science is doing a very good job right now. So, so you know, the expectation is also good. And then we are going to, to some predictions in, in 2,100 of the population that was increased, you know, increased by, by, four, uh, by, by another 4 million. And, and, the, and what is the main reason? So um, uh, there will be more children, there will be more adults, or there will be more old people. So actually, the you know the the, the, the correct answer is um, B. You know there will be more adults between 15 and 70 years old. So we are we are. We are also the population is something very interesting and in, in the way that we are going. And the last one that is related with the topic that we're talking about today is about the disasters. 
you know, the, from natural from natural hazards. So in the last 100 years, the number of deaths due to the disasters from natural hazard it has more than double, has remained about the same, or it has been reduced to less than half. So you know, most of the people answer A or even B, you know, but actually the correct answer is C. It has been reduced more, uh, reduced reduced less than half. So, so it's actually that we are doing a very good job here because we are applying science, we are applying data, we are um, actually study these 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 natural hazards, and we are start to to, to come up with uh, different models, you know, or different tools. That is something that we're actually talking about today uh, that we can apply to mitigate this risk due to a natural hazard. Uh, so, you know, having problems here with the presentation. Okay, now. So, when we are talking about natural hazards, there is a lot of natural hazards. You know, most of the people, you know, are facing a natural hazards like, like earthquakes because they are living close to the seismic activity regions, or sometimes tsunamis, or volcano, or floats, or hurricanes, or landslides, or precipitation. Or, so there is a lot of, of those, you know? And, and there are also uh, the natural hazard. We, we don't know when, when are gonna happen the next one. We are gonna, we don't really know when we are gonna ha happen the next earthquake, or how, how big it's gonna be, you know? The same happened with all of these hazards. But we know that we have to live with these natural hazards because uh, our infrastructure, our houses, our buildings are uh, uh, in, 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 in these regions that we have to deal with these natural hazards. So the human activities play a very important role as Professor Dayala mentioned, is because we have to do something about it. And is really related more with our infrastructure, our buildings, you know, and and how we can uh, be uh, be prepared, you know, to deal with these natural hazards when it comes, on, on where are triggered because because of the of the, of the natural events, you know, and here's a, here is a very good example, you know, of how we can compare when we we apply science to mitigate. For example, in earthquakes, um, the, 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 the hazard, you know? So it's a comparison between an earthquake in California, 6.0 of magnitude, and 6.1 is pretty much the same in China. And when you compare the results, it's something very amazing. So it's because uh, we uh, United States was very prepared from a long time ago, you know, uh, and uh, do some implementation of, of this, uh, natural hazard and how, how we can deal with it, you know? So, so implement uh, the knowledge from this, from the, from this, from the science, from the studies to be more uh, prepared through building codes, for example. So the, 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 the buildings can support, you know, can resist earthquakes, you know, better. And are, they're not gonna collapse. And of course, and it is something that is very important to apply to other countries, you know? For example, here in China, China is a country that is very well developed and, and it has a lot of population. So it is important to protect the people, you know? So we have a lot of things that we can do regarding, you know, the, to mitigate uh, the risk. So, and, and you know, and, and you know, affects the, the whole the whole country when it happens, you know? It is, here is a very uh, good graph when you have the gross capital formation against the time. And when a, a disaster happen, you know, in a high income countries, of course there is, you know, a, 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 a problem. So you have to invest money, you have to, uh, there are money that was uh, ready for other things, but you have to, to take this money to, 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 to attend the disaster. But the, 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 the country is keeping, a, you know, in, in, a, in a growing, you no? Know? But when it happens in, a, in low or middle countries, it's not the same way because they are not well prepared, you know? They don't know how to deal with, they don't have plans, they, they don't have the implementation in the codes, 
in the building codes, how to deal with these natural disasters, you know, or, or and also that the people are taking the decision, they don't have the tools to, to, to you know, to understand and to, to quantify the problem. So it's something that we, in, in our country, we have to do better in order that it is not affecting too much the gross capital formation in the time. So, uh, sorry, so the disaster can be really an obstacle to the de development. So it's something that the decision makers has to deal with and they need to know that. And they need to not also know that, but also apply um, different plans in order to reduce uh, the risk to, to have these kind of problems. So this is why we have the, uh, the, platform, the platform CAPRA, which is a website initiative I mean to strengthen the institutional capacity to assess and understand and communicate disaster risk with the objective to integrate available information into political and development programs. It was an uh, initiative that began in 2008 as a partner between the Coordination Center of Natural Disaster Prevention in Central America, the United Nations Office of Disaster Risk, and the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank. So really the objective of the platform was to raise awareness among the Central American countries. And the idea was to provide a set of tools that would allow them to understand, you know, to understand the people in Central America, the, the, to understand better the risk related to adverse natural events. So this is why we have this CAPRA platform. And, and, plat and, and, and CAPRA platform helps to develop first a common methodology, which is very important because uh, you know when you have a common methodology, you can learn, you can learn from other countries, from other cases, and also you can improve the methodology. So it's something very, very important to have. Second, to sensitive decision makers, also very important because you know the politicians are the people that are going to take the decisions, that are going to responsible to implement the, the, the measures. So it is very important uh, to, to, to have these uh, sensitive of decision makers. Also to formulate management strategies, very important uh, at the risk level of local, because can be, a, for example, in a city, you know, but also national or regional, which is something also very important. So, so it's also provide uh, these, these, these uh, formulation of management strategies. And finally, integrate the disaster risk information generating into, into the development policies and programs, which was also very important. So I'm going to put you here some fundamental elements to understand the risk, the disaster risk. For example, worst possible events, something that we have to keep in mind, worst economic losses, annual losses, asset repair, reconstruction, human losses, uh, retrofitting measures and activities. In the immediate action that we have to take when, when this uh, disaster uh, happened, medium and long term intervention, because it's something, something that we keep in mind, and emergency, emergency, emergency preparation. So, so the, 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 the good to have a tool like this is that we can be prepared for, for you know, we can simulate and, and, and we can be prepared and we can take uh, measures, measures to, to, to deal with. Here's the, you know, the general methodology that, that, that has been developed through the, through the CAPRA that was first to, to, to have the hazard. So we have to have the, the hazard identified. Um, um, and then um, do we have an exposure, you know, depend if it's local or, or, in, or, 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 region, or country wise or regional wise. So we have the exposure. For example, in the cities could be, you know, the buildings, the important buildings or schools or the or, or all combined, you know, and then we, uh, or we have this posture, we can find the vulnerability of these buildings or the infrastructure and then combine them in order, and this is why the platform is doing a very, uh, this is that the platform were created to combine the hazard and vulnerability and the exposure and try to come up with the damage, you know. So once we have the damage, we can, we can um, calculate the losses, economic losses and human losses, you know? And then when we have all these data, we can have some applications, some, some, some results that we can use. So we can have reduced 
reduction because we can do where are the you know the infrastructure for example that needs uh, main attention and main retrofit measurements you know then we have to uh, like benefit cost analysis because we have uh, we don't have enough money you know in our countries so we have to understand uh, with some amount of money how we are going to to invest in the best way also the insurance is something that happens in the cities and in the infrastructure we we can insurance our infrastru infrastructure. So when uh, um, an event happen, like for example, earthquake, we are going to have you know money to uh, be prepared to be uh, to 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 kind to, to to attend you know the, the 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 disaster. The emergency plan is very important. You know, it is very important because we uh, we need to be prepared, and this is one of the most important things because. We forget, you know, we, we, we know that we are in, for example, in an active uh, seismic region zone, but because, you know, it happens every 30 years, 15 years. So we are not, we, 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 we can like, we can forget, you know, so we, we, we need to know and the, 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 the politicians, the, the authorities need to know how to react, you know, so we have to be prepared for these emergency plans. Um, and also, of course, positive plans. So it's something that that is the general need, and 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 we and we cannot think that the hazards are not related with each other. Actually, is very related. So we have like a multi-hazard assessment that we have to 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 have. So we have different uh, hazards that I show you that we call primary hazards that has some uh, effects. You know, for example, earthquakes are ground shaking. Rainfalls has precipitation, hurricane has precipitation, wind speed, storm. And then when happen, they have secondary effects that are combined with other uh, hazards. For example, earthquake can trigger tsunamis and land and land slides. But rainfall can uh, trigger uh, uh, land slides and flow. So, so it's, it's everything is, can be related. So we have to think that there is not a hazard individual, but it are multi-hazard. When, when, when we're thinking that way, we have the whole picture. And of course, we have secondary effects that also we have to keep in mind when we are analyzing this kind of risk. You know, like for example, in tsunamis, run up heights, and, 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 and we have other effects that we have to keep in mind. At the end, everything can be integrated in the crap of a platform use. From the probability, uh, probability risk, uh, uh, of course, the, 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 event, the events can happen in, in, in a time window that different years. So, so it is important that several events in different years leading to a different levels of losses. So it's something that also we have to keep in mind. Keep in mind because this is the way that we are going to take the measures. At the end, the losses is that they are going to give us the key way that we are going to take the final measures, measures, measurements in the cities. And this is the kind of results that most probably Rafael is going to show you very detailed in some examples about the, 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 the result that we can have in the platform. For example, the low success curves. So uh, they define the annual frequency of transcendence of an economic losses. So you have here the, the excellence rate against the losses. Or you can have the probability maximum losses, like we call PML, which is related with the long period of the time for example, in an earthquake, return periods, and we can have the probably, uh, probable maximum losses. You know, so it's, it's, it, this is the kind of results that we can get with the platform. And also, uh, once we have the results, we can plot the results. You know, we can show the results. Uh, for example, uh, in a geographical distribution. So here is an example of annual average losses graphically in a graphical distribution. In, 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 this is from Salvador. Um, and, and, and you see in the left, here are the annual losses absolute. So it's the value. So in, in, in all the portfolio here that we have uh, for the buildings, uh, and you see in the red, where are the losses? What is the cost of the losses? And here in the right, you have the relative losses, which are, which are um, uh, divided you know, by the replacement value. So you have the, these ones are the, uh, the, the relative uh, losses are the absolute losses divided by, by the replacement value. So here you, you see different ways that you can interpret the results, you know? 
which are very important to the maker, maker decisions. So in the, in the platform that we are going to see uh, or, or that you are going to have access uh, um, is a software really in which the hazard, the vulnerability and disposal can be integrated to obtain a risk metric like the one that I present earlier. Um, um, and here is, a, a, you know, a screenshot that how is how it looks like. Um, it, it's a software that, that that can be downloaded directly from the web the web page. Here is the web page in, in top. Um, it is currently management by the Universidad of Los Andes in Bogota, Colombia. And additionally, on the web page, you can find additional resources uh, on the cap on the plata on the on the Capra platform. Here are some of the resources. So there are several uh, resources available in relation with the hazards and climate change, exposure and vulnerability, risk assessment, and other practical applications and, and resources that you can find in, in the platform. Also, um, 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 are related here in uh, this is the way that, 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 the, that the platform looks like. So there are here related, for example, the, ge the, ge the ge geological hazard are related here. So we have earthquake, tsunamis, and volcano, but also we have hydrological hazard uh, that are here uh, listed, and also we have climate change. And here is some of the example. If you go to, for example, to hazard. You can find the available information related with uh, the geological hazards, such as earthquakes and land slices, land slices or hydrogeological hazards like throw fluids and hurricanes. Um, so, so the idea is uh, in, in a second, Rafael is going to show you some applications of this platform. Um, so, so that you can use is is free to to download. There is not any. Thing that you can do, just go to them and, and try it and, and there is a very good tools and, and tutorials so so I, I i recommend you to go there and try and of course we are happy to assist you if you have any questions and also i want to thank you to again dina uh professor dina yala to, to to give us this space and to be part of the unesco chair and also i want to thank uh, 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 or have uh, or mention uh, Professor Luis Jamin. Uh, he was actually my professor in the university, then my colleague, an excellent friend, an excellent person. And he was, uh, as, as Professor Dina was, the responsible to have the CAPRA at the Universidad of Los Andes. So thank you very much for your time. I will leave you with Rafael that, I, that is going to show you examples um, that uh, that I already talked about Capri. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juan. Um, I'm going to share my screen at this moment. Okay, I think it's now okay. Well, thank you, Juan, and thank you, Dina, for the introduction and for your presentations. What we are going to see now in this uh, in this section is the presentation about the probabilistic risk assessment for disaster risk reduction in school infrastructure. So we are going to measure to join what Juan Francisco was saying about Capra to what Dina was saying about the school infrastructure to see how we can merge these things and how we can with this establish a, a, a disaster risk reduction strategy in a framework of disaster risk management. Um, so First, I want to recall some of the things that Dina mentioned at the beginning. The first one is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, so as, as we saw, education is by itself a human right. So therefore, it's of high importance uh, for, for development. And also, when we see the Sustainable Development Goals, we can see that, the, in particular, the goal number four is about quality education. But education have a broader impact in, in additional goals. So that's very important to have in, in mind. In particular, we also saw uh, at Dina's presentation that um, the school infrastructure is one of the barriers for quality education. So therefore, we can help and, and we can make a better um, education system through the school infrastructure. But at the same time, we have seen in the past um, that several 
that there are several natural hazards that may affect the school infrastructure. So there, there is a risk and it is very important to notice what Juan Francisco was saying in the previous uh, presentation, that is that human activity plays a vital role in how the hike is the risk related to a particular natural hazard. So in here, I want to make the distinction of uh, what we in the past know as natural disasters, that there is no such a thing like, like a natural disaster. Disasters are a mix of, of several of several conditions, and in particular of a vulnerable infrastructure located in a place where there is a natural hazard. So, so therefore, we can understand better the disasters as human disasters or anthropo or anthropogenic disasters. And in particular, we have seen in the past a lot of examples in several places uh, all around the world about damages in educational infrastructure. We can see in this video, for example, um, at the exact moment where an earthquake um, hits like an uh, educational facility. We see how in a classroom, the evacuation makes very difficult um, when this happens and also what happened to all the non-structural elements. And we can also see these in other types of locations in a school, such as a sport facility, for example. And all around the world, we have seen the devastating effects of natural hazards and, and the disasters in a school infrastructure. For example, in here we can see in the case of Peru, in which uh, we had an earthquake in 2001, in which we experienced were a lot of this problematic that will be repeated in a lot of case studies, which is the short column effect. So it is very important to notice that we have like uh, an infrastructure that was designed in one particular manner and it was behaving in a different manner. And, and this can be solved. This is not a problem that is impossible to solve. This have um, some solutions uh, as we are going to see in, one moment, in some moments. We can also see, for example, this type of problems with masonry infill walls in which they fail in plane. For example, in here we can see a shear, shear failure, but this will also lead in and out of plane fail, uh, failure, and this will be a threat to all the occupants. Similarly, we can have uh, we can see in here the case of Turkey, in which we have a building, a three-story building, that after the earthquake, the first floor totally collapses. And here we have that same problem of a short column axis in all these in all these windows. So at the end, what can happen in this type of cases, for example, is that all the first story was totally collapsed. We can see in here also short column effects. We can see in this other picture some of the infill masonry walls that have failed out of plane. Um, and these are very similar problematics as the one we see in the previous case. Something very similar happened in Dominican Republic, in which we have also a first story failure, in which we, we had in this particular typology due also to short column. We can see in here some building that stays in, that didn't collapse, but it's in a very critical condition. We can see, for example, some slabs that, that had failed inside the classrooms, for example, which will be a major threat for the occupants. We have the case of Haiti in the same island, but um, in, in another earthquake in which we see always the same case. In here, we can see again this short column that is represented also in this picture. And we also can see the, the masonry infill walls that in this case failed out of plane, uh, generating well critical, critical damage into the infrastructure. Similarly, we have this case in Nepal. Again, we have short column or captive column effect in here and here. We can see some in, pay, in plane failures in the masonry walls in these pictures um, and so on. We can, we can go like through a lot of cases, in particular, one of the last uh, cases and one of the most critical happened in Mexico uh, in 2017, in which uh, a school facility and a school building collapses in the middle of a, of a lecture. So this is a critical and, and a, an example that shows how important it is to assess this type of damage and to understand the risk and then to, based on this, generate some disaster risk reduction strategies. So before going to, to what is a probabilistic risk assessment, I wanted to bring some of the definitions of the terms because 
it, it is very common to um, meet some some uh, terminology to don't have like a clear distinction of what is, for example, a vulnerability, what is, for example, a hazard, how they related to risk. So we, I, I take in here some of the definitions by the United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction Office. The first concept that I want to talk about is about is the exposure. So in here, in simple words, words, what we are talking about is the situation of a specific infrastructure that is located in a particular region. Exposure also refers to exposure of people, exposure of housing, exposure of production capacity of roads and any other um, tangible asset. But in this particular presentation, we will talk the exposure as the school infrastructure that is exposed uh, in a particular, where that is located in a particular region. Then we have the hazard and the hazard is very important to understand it as a process. So the hazard is a process that may cause lo loss of life or may cause injuries or, make, uh, or may cause property damage. In this case, we're focusing on natural hazards. There are other type of hazards such as anthropogenic or socio-natural. But in this case, we want to talk in particular about the earthquake hazard. Uh, but it's important to understand that uh, the hazard by itself will not generate the, the damage. It's, it, it has the possibility to generate that damage. And finally, we have the vulnerability, which is the conditions or, or, or how the exposed assets will behave in, in relation with a particular hazard. So in, in simple terms, what we have with these three, with these three like very important uh, terms is the exposure is what I have in a particular region. The hazard is what can happen in that particular region. And the vulnerability is how the infrastructure that I, ha that I have located in that region will behave uh, due to this particular not not a hazard that I am analyzing. And with these concepts or these three main models, we can then define what is disaster risk. And disaster risk refers to the potential losses. And now we are talking about the potential damages and the potential uh, injuries also, and the potential effects that a specific hazard can, can generate. So it's very important to understand disaster risk as a function of hazard exposure and vulnerability and a function that should be probabilistic because we don't know what will happen tomorrow, what is going to happen in 10 days or in 10 years, but we can understand or we can try to uh, assess based on past information what uh, is the most probable thing that will happen. And once I characterize the risk, then the next natural step and the next natural concept is disaster risk management. So once we have this disaster risk, we have the knowledge of the risk, we know what will happen and what is the kind of effects that we need, that we should expect for, for a particular hazard. We can start doing some management of that hazard. The natural step is to reduce the hazard. So as, as we are going to see in some examples, we can, for example, retrofit our buildings or even replace our buildings to, to some that are less vulnerable, and this will reduce the risk. And there are other strategies such as risk transfer, for example, with an insurance company or, or maybe some emergency um, management related to early warning system or to, an, or to the development of emergency or evacuation plan, plans, for example. So just to take all these concepts into, into a particular process. What we should do is to develop an exposure model in which we characterize the location of each one of the buildings, in which we characterize the economic valuation, which is closely related to the replacement costs, and in which we identify the typologies that we have in a particular region. Then we need to characterize the hazard, and this can be characterized into and well, in a framework of a probabilistic risk assessment by an stochastic event catalog. This means a catalog with several synthetic events representing, if we are talking about earthquakes, representing particular earthquakes, or if we are talking about hurricane wind, representing particular um, hurricane trajectories. And then we have the vulnerability, which is represented by vulnerability functions or fragility functions that we will talk in a moment. 
Um, and in here, we are talking about a function that correlates an intensity measure, which is related to the hazard that I am analyzing. For example, if I am working on earthquake, the intensity measure can be, for example, the ground acceleration. But if I am working with hurricane, the intensity measure should be wind velocity, for example. Um, and this intensity measure should be correlated with the mean damage rate, which means at the end how the structure will be damaged when this intensity measure start to being large. And it's important to also make emphasis that there's one particular vulnerability functions by each one of the typologies and by each one of the hazards. Um, I cannot use one vulnerability functions for all the assets, for example, because each of them have different characteristics. So I need to characterize and to understand how will be the behavior of each one of these assets that are exposed in, in my model. And once I have these three models, I can then understand and, can, and I can assess the, the, the risk through a probabilistic risk assessment. In here, we are talking about um, Capra software in, in the Capra platform that was the one that was um, mentioned by Juan Francisco and that was intro, like introduced by him. Um, but there are other, other uh, platforms and programs to do this. Um, in particular, we are talking about Capra, but you should know that there are many, many others that are available um, for these kind of purposes. And what we want to obtain through this probabilistic risk assessment is first some economic risk metrics. The most common ones are the annual expected losses and then the probable maximum losses. But we can also characterize broader, broader effects, for example, the human losses, or we can also characterize the, for example, the human injuries or, or the interruption time that will be generated due to a disaster. And this is information, and, and this information should be used then for a disaster risk management um, program. And in the risk, disaster risk management program, as we mentioned previously, we have several steps. And today we will be talking about risk reduction. We, we want to focus on that, but it's important also to have in mind that this is not the only step of a disaster risk management uh, strategy. There are also other, other strategies such risk transfer, for example, as, as we talked a moment ago, early warning system, emergency plans, or post-event plans. So now I'm going to go um, to each one of these models to explain briefly. Uh, we are not going to enter in the technical details, but what I wanted to explain is how this can be understood and, and how also uncertainty is considered in each one of these steps and how Capra can give also some tools uh, in each one of these steps to assess at the end the, the, all the, the risk assessment. So first, talking about the exposure, what we should have in mind is that there's a lot of variability in infrastructure. The, the school buildings are not the same. We have several typologies, several types, several construction um, materials. For example, we can find timber uh, buildings. We can find earth uh, buildings of, made of adobe, for example. We can have unreinforced masonry or concrete buildings. We can have one story until three or four stories, for example. And to characterize all this variability, we need like a systemized approach. So in here, we have the taxonomy system that was developed uh, under the Global Library of School Infrastructure, a program uh, from the World Bank, and in particular for the Global Program for Safer Schools, in which 12 parameters were identified that are the ones that most affect the vulnerability. So it's important to characterize these for all of the elements in the portfolio. The first three ones are known as the main parameters, which are the main structural system. Um, then we are talking about uh, the second parameter is the height range, how many stories of a particular building. And third, we have the seismic design level. Then we have the next nine parameters that are known as the secondary parameters, which are parameters that also affect the vulnerability, but maybe in a, in, in, in a different uh, way. We have in the first place structural regularities. If a building is irregular, we can have a, a very different behavior. We can have some torsional effects, for example. The next, we have the diaphragm type. If we are talking about flexible or rigid diaphragms, um, we have also panel or span length. 
We have the wall openings or the pier type, wall openings for masonry buildings and pier type for reinforced concrete um, moment resistant frames. We have also the foundation type. If it's a shallow foundation or a deep foundation, it will generate a different behavior of the building. We also consider, a, in well, in the taxonomy, it's also considered the seismic bounding risk. If there is any some seismic bounding risk in the surroundings of each one of the buildings, if there was an effective seismic retrofitting, um, how is the structural health condition if the building is in good or in poor condition? And also um, the type of non-structural components, if they are fragile or if they have some seismic design that make them ductile and that will not be uh, uh, another threat or another harm for the occupants. And why to do that? Well, because we want to find groups of buildings with similar characteristics. So we have, for example, a geographic distribution of, of a portfolio. This type of geographic distribution can be handled and managed by different softwares, uh, like several uh, geographic information system software such as QGIS or ArcGIS. Um, but independently of that, what we want to do is to find those buildings that are similar to the others. So we would like to find that type of clusters. And the idea of finding these groups or clusters is to then find the index buildings, which is which are at the end a particular building that have representative characteristics of all the group that we are analyzing. And why we should we should do that? Well, because we it is technically and economically impossible to go building by building to design a particular retrofitting. So what we can do is to find these groups, find a building that is very that have representative characteristics, representative characteristics and develop a retrofitting alternative to this building, then quantify how much does that cost and obtain unitary cost that will be applicable to all the elements in that cluster, which we are talking about buildings. So unitary cost that we can apply to all the buildings in that particular cluster. In, but it's important to have in mind to, to take into account in here that there's also again like some uncertainty in here because we are representing a group of several buildings into only one and we should consider in this process that the building may change a little bit we may have different for example mechanical properties or different geometrical distribution some may have for example uh, two classrooms the other can have four and all of these should be taken into account and in consideration all throughout the process then if, if we go to the hazard model, we have in here mm, several, several alternatives. One, for example, if we are talking about an uh, earthquake hazard or seismic hazard, we can start uh, with the historical earthquake catalog, then with a characterization of the, of the sources or the faults. For example, if we have some subduction faults or some crustal faults, we can characterize its geometry it's different like general characteristic, for example, the rake angle and, 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 and several more. And also we can assign then the historical earthquakes to each one of the faults to understand how is the seismicity of each one of these. And also there's another important effect that should be also considered and is the side effects amplification. For example, if there's some soft soils in a particular zone of the, of the region that I am analyzing, it's very important to consider it because the behavior will be very different um, of the particular buildings in that region where the, the soft soil is, is, in, is uh, present. And with all this information, it is possible then to obtain a stochastic um, catalog of synthetic events in which if each one of these events is characterized by a magnitude in terms of the acceleration distribution in, in, the, in the region that I am analyzing and the frequency of each one of these events. This, how often I should expect an event with these characteristics. For this, there are also several uh, alternatives or programs that can be used to develop this kind of, of catalogs, in particular under the Capra platform. It is Capra Eco, which is under development and should be available soon. Uh, but there are other programs that um, have been developed by third parties that can be also used. Then if we go to the vulnerability model, we already characterize what, how to obtain an exposure model, how a hazard model should be um, analyzed and characterized. 
and now we should go to the vulnerability mode. And first, I wanted to make like the differentiation of the fragility functions and the vulnerability function because those are very similar concepts that maybe generate some confusion. So when we talk about fragility functions, we can talk about a building by itself, a fragility at building level, or we can also talk by component or, or, or by the several components that are located in a particular building. But if we talk about the general building as a building-based approach, we can have several damage states. For example, in here, we have three damage states. And what each one of these functions show um, is the probability of exceeding that particular damage state for a particular intensity measure. So for example, if I will go uh, into this graph with 0.2 as an intensity measure, I will have almost zero probability of exceedance the damage state three. I will have a large probability of exceeding the damage state two around 60%, and I will be almost certain that I will reach the damage state one. So this is very important to have in mind. And also another type of representing this same information is through a vulnerability function in which we uh, like we don't define each particular damage state, but we define a mean curve in here that relates now not a probability of exceedance, but a mean damage ratio. So if we reach 100%, we will have the collapse of the building and we will have the damage states implicitly included into all, into all this range. So it's very important that to, to mention also that this is a mean from a distribution and that's why it is included in here a variance curve. And if we go like in depth to what I am showing in here, this is a vulnerability function in which I have the mean that I, that I presented in the previous slide, but I have a distribution of mean damage ratio in here. And it's very important to consider this because at the end, I don't know how a particular earthquake will affect a particular building. And there are several um, elements that can change that behavior. For example, the frequency of, of the emotions, uh, the amplitude of it, the direction in which it hits the structure, and also characteristics related to the structure by itself. So as, as we mentioned, we are making a vulnerability function for an index buildings, but uh, when we are talking of a particular index buildings, there's a lot of uncertainty in it. So the mechanical properties can be different from the ones that I uh, included in my models. Maybe the geometrical distribution will be slightly different too, and these will all be included in this particular um, like bandwidth uh, that in here is presented as deviation, as the standard deviation, and in the previous one as the variance, but at the end, well, it's it's the same. It's, it's like the importance of having or taking this into account that this is not a deterministic function. And to assess this, I'm not going to enter into the details, but uh, in the framework of the, of the glossy, the same framework in which the taxonomy uh, was developed, there are some uh, methodologies to obtain fragility functions and other to obtain vulnerability functions. So we have building-based damage assessment or component-based damage assessment in, in each one of the cases. And in particular, inside the Capra uh, suite or the Capra platform, there are two programs that are available in the web page. The first one is named uh, Fumbul Simplified, which is created to edit existing uh, vulnerability functions. And the other one is Fumbul Components, which is a tool that was developed to integrate the engineering demand parameters and the components and the damages of the components of each one of the elements. So that one is to generate new, new fragility functions. So now at the moment, we have seen how to obtain an exposure model, a hazard model, and a vulnerability model. With all these models, we can then go to the to, in this case, to the Capra platform to obtain the probabilistic risk, to do well the probabilistic risk assessment and obtain some economic metrics. One of the most common, as Juan Francisco already explained, is the maximum probable losses, which relates at the end the hazard in terms of the return period uh, with the maximum probable losses. For, so, for example, in this case, um, we can see that for 500 uh, years of return period, we should expect a maximum probable losses during that time around of 28% of the total cost of the portfolio. Another important uh, risk metric is, are, well, are the absolute, the annual expected losses, 
which can be interpreted as the absolute value in terms of the economic value or in a relative way um, no, normalizing the value of the losses in terms of the cost of the elements that are exposed. So, for example, in this particular case, we can see, for example, the unreinforced masonry of a very large relative expected annual losses, which we can conclude that is a very vulnerable building. Um, and for the moment, resistant frames, we have a like a lower level of vulnerability, but a higher level of absolute losses, which can be um, understood because there are, in this particular case, a lot of moment resistant frames in this portfolio. So the losses, even though are less for each one of them, since they are so many, um, the absolute will be very large. So that's why it's important to analyze not only the absolute value of the losses or not only the relative value of the losses, but to use this data to understand how the, is the risk in a particular portfolio. Finally, in all this um, methodology, we have the disaster risk management. And before going into how a disaster risk can be reduced, I want to talk a little bit about the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, in which there are four priorities characterized. The first one is to understand the risk, which can be done through analysis, such as the one that we presented uh, through a probabilistic risk assessment um, model. The second priority is strengthening disaster risk governance. The third one is investing in disaster risk reduction for resilience. And the fourth, enhancing disaster preparedness. So this, what, what we are going to talk in the, in the following case study is this particular priority tree, which is how can I achieve this disaster risk reduction? So as, as we mentioned before, what I can change is the vulnerability of the infrastructure, and I can change it, for example, by retrofitting a particular building. So there are several um, strategies on how this can, be, this can be done. And at the end, what I want is to um, reduce this curve that I have in red into this one that is in blue in here. So I can reduce the maximum probable losses, and this will also being uh, presented in lowering the expected annual losses. So what I want is to reduce from the current condition to an acceptable level of, of risk. And here I want to introduce two concepts that are very important. And the first one is the acceptable risk. So first we need to have in mind that the risk cannot be um, lowered into zero. It is impossible to have zero risk. We will always uh, have some, some risk level. But I need to define as a decision maker what is the acceptable risk that I will be tolerating. And how should I um, define this acceptable risk? Well, it depends in many, many um, conditions. For example, the economic um, condition, if I have money or not to lower this, this to retrofit this building, or if I have limited funds, how much I can, how, how many buildings I can retrofit. Also, there are political um, reasons that may lead or not to a particular redu risk reduction program. There are cultural also characteristics. For example, if uh, a school of some particular material uh, doesn't want to be changed to because of cultural uh, reasons, well, that should be taken into account to define that acceptable risk. And also, for example, technical reasons. Maybe it is impossible to reach some particular area so we need to define how much uh, I, I need to accept. And the other concept, the second one, is the residual risk. And the residual risk is, in this case, this particular uh, blue line in which, as, as, I, as I mentioned before, I cannot lower more than that. So this residual risk need, needs to be managed with, by, with, with other type of strategies in the framework of disaster risk management. So, for example, I can transfer that risk through an insurance company, or I can be prepared to that risk in relation to, for example, developing early warning systems or emergency plans. So the acceptable risk can be the same as the residual risk, or can be some other point between these two lines, between the current conditions and the residual risk, minimum level of risk that I can achieve. So as, as a summary, what we have in here is that the probabilistic risk assessment is comprised by three main models. The first one is the exposure model, the second one, the hazard, and the third one, the vulnerability. 
as we mentioned before, the exposure is what I have in the particular region, the hazard, what can happen in that region, and the vulnerability, how the buildings will respond to that particular hazard. And this can be integrated into a probabilistic risk assessment that can be then used for disaster risk management. But it's important to have in mind that the exposure, it's almost impossible to change. I, even though if I can move, for example, one building to another place, there's no place with no hazard, so I can't reduce, it's very difficult to reduce the risk by modifying exposure. The same happened with the hazard when we are talking about the earthquakes or hurricanes. I cannot change the, that underground region, region that generates that um, type of events, so it's impossible to change. But what I can do is to modify the vulnerability. And how can I do that? Well, as, as, as we are going to see in the next examples, I can retrofit the buildings or I can replace the buildings, for example, and this will generate a reduction of the, of the entire risk of the portfolio. So I can use this probabilistic risk assessment as a tool for then using the data into disaster risk management and in particular in risk reduction. So I'm going to show you two um, case studies very fast. The first one is this in El Salvador, in which we have 5,000 school facilities with around 15,000 um, buildings that are used by 1.2 million of students. So in this case, we did the same process. We defined the exposure, and we defined this exposure, identified the particular index buildings. Then we developed a hazard model in which we included 25,000 scenarios with a minimum magnitude of 5.1 and a maximum magnitude of 7.75. And we also developed in here a simplified site, um, site effects model. And we developed the vulnerability curves using the, the, the methodology that I presented before. And with this, we translated this or we obtained these risk metrics which are the expected annual losses and the, and the probable maximum losses. We can see, for example, in here that for 500 um, years of return period, we have 11% of damages uh, related to the total cost of that, exposed, of that exposure. And we can see, for example, that the expected annual losses in this uh, case study um, can be or are around 9.5 million uh, US dollars. So, I can also analyze the, the data by typology. For example, I can obtain the expected annual losses aggregated by typology in relative and in absolute um, condition. I can also analyze the expected annual losses in terms of the departments to see which department is in a, or have a, a greater or a lower risk. And with this information, I can then develop some retrofitting uh, alternatives. We are not going into the details on how this was done or the particularities of each retrofitting, but I wanted, but I, and, and this will be treated in future courses and uh, under the UNESCO chair um, agenda, as, as Dina mentioned at the beginning. But what we wanted to show you is that with this type of retrofitting, we can then obtain vulnerability functions and change like the, the, the original vulnerability functions that are presented in here into these dashed lines which present a lower vulnerability. So we can then integrate this into the same risk model that we had uh, at the beginning, and we can then understand how the risk will be reduced. For example, we can hear that the risk can be reduced for 500 uh, years as per uh, as return period from 11% of the cost of the total portfolio to 4% of the cost of the total portfolio. And we also can see, for example, that the expected annual losses can be reduced from 9.5 US millions to, for example, 3 US million dollars. So this information that can be used, but I want to recall the concepts of remaining an acceptable risk. So this is the risk of implementing all the retrofitting, all the retrofittings into all the portfolio, but this may be, for example, be too costly, uh, like too expensive for a particular country. So we need to find what is the available budget, how much I can reduce the risk, uh, and that will be the acceptable risk that I am going to, to tolerate. And then we can develop other type of strategies for the remaining risk. 
Um, in this particular case, we also try to um, like found how many percentage of the buildings will be in different damage states. Um, I don't want to go into the details, but in this figure, what we need to know is that the green is good. It's a building that is still operative for, uh, for a return period, for a particular return period. And the red one are the one that I don't want because um, this damage state is collapse prevention in which the building will almost be uh, collapsed. And this other one is in terms of buildings that have already collapsed. So I don't want uh, to have any of those buildings for any of these return periods. So what I can do is to implement a retrofitting to reduce that band of red buildings into zero. And in here, again, we have still some buildings that may experience one of those damage states for larger return periods. And that's one of the reasons that a risk cannot be a, like translated into zero. And um, we can also see this typology by typology, not only by the whole portfolio. And this will this information can help us to pass from a current conditions in, with a current critical conditions to a more acceptable or, or tolerable conditions. So just as a summary, what we did in El Salvador, uh, or in this case study that I am presenting is to characterize the hazard model, the exposure and the vulnerability. With this, we obtain the risk um, assessment in the current conditions. And with the information obtained with this risk assessment, we can then uh, develop some risk reduction strategies um, that in this case is a structural retrofitting of the buildings. And with this, then we can obtain results in a retrofitted conditions. And we can also develop some plans um, to, to prioritize the, the interventions. But what I have shown in this presentation is a very structural engineering point of view or approach. So there's also the possibility to see, in a, to see this problem in a broader approach and also include, for example, the number of people that are in danger for a particular hazard and for a particular, for example, return period. So for this, we are going to briefly show you a similar example here in the Dominican Republic in which we have 6,000 uh, school facilities with 18,000 of school buildings that are used by around 1.5 million of students. And here, the process is very similar. We identify the main or the index buildings, the main typologies, which in this case correspond to 93% of the total portfolio. Then we developed the hazard model. In this case, the model was comprised by 9,000 seismic scenarios and we developed also the vulnerability model uh, which is a set of vulnerability functions in here i'm only showing three but there are particular vulnerability functions for each one of the typologies and with this we can understand risk for example in here for 500 uh, years as return period we have 13.3 percent of the total cost of the portfolio, which is slightly higher as the risk that we have that we identified in the previous case study. And we have an annual expected losses of around 13 million um, US dollars. We can understand this or analyze this also as the expected annual losses for each one of the typologies. Uh, and we can see also the results in a geographical distribution. So in here we have the results in terms of the absolute losses and in terms of the relative losses. That was what Juan Francisco explained some moments ago. That is very important to analyze both cases, how much, how large are the losses in each one of the buildings, but also how large is the relative losses for each one of the buildings. Because I may have, for example, a very small school facility with a very small level of losses, but at the end, that facility can, for example, be experiencing some collapses for, for earthquakes, for minor earthquakes. So I, I need to understand both of, of these uh, metrics. And based on these metrics, we can define as uh, similarly as we did in the previous case study, uh, the retrofitting alternatives by each one of the typologies. We can obtain the vulnerability functions for each one of them and then assess uh, again the, the risk 
um, the probabilistic risk assessment. So in here we have also some results. We have this new PML curve for the retrofitted conditions. We can see also that the expected annual loss can decrease from 13 uh, millions to 4 millions. And this information can also be presented in terms of the annual expected losses, in which we can see, for example, these large bars can be reduced to these ones um, by means of a structural retrofitting. And how geographically is, uh, well, are the losses distributed and how this can be reduced. For example, we are passing from this critical condition in all of the north part of the island to a more tolerable condition. And remember, we are not going into the condition of all the buildings with zero losses, but we are going or we are transforming the, the, the risk into a more, more tolerable condition. We can also try to identify the number of students that are in risk or, or at risk in the current condition for each one of the return periods. So for example, we can identify in which buildings that may collapse or may be in a collapse prevent damage state uh, will be in, in taking, for example, classes in those buildings. And we can see that in the, in the risk, in the fully risk or in the fully retrofitted condition, we can reduce the gap until zero for, for the first three return periods and to a very much lower level for the latest in return period. So finally, this is information that can be used to develop disaster risk reduction programs. In particular, in, in this case, we had three main objectives. The first one was reducing the risk of death or human affectation to the educational community. So we wanted to change all those buildings that were in collapse uh, for a return period of around 500 years into a damaged state that will not harm the life of the student to a life safety damaged state. The second one was to reduce the damage to infrastructure. It, it, that means to change all those collapse prevention to buildings that can be immediately occupied. And in the third um, objective is to reduce the eventual interruption of the educational service. So we, for, for lower return periods, that means for earthquakes that are a, in a, in like for frequent earthquakes, we want that our infrastructure will be still operative. And there are several strategies that can be used to prioritize. For example, uh, we can make a benefit cost analysis in which we obtain the benefits as the difference between the expected annual losses in current conditions and the expected annual losses in retrofitted conditions. And this can be divided by the retrofitting cost uh, multiplied by the interest rate or the cost of opportunity. Or we can have other type of metrics for prioritizing, such as the efficiency cost, for example, in which we multiply the benefit cost by the number of students. So we take into account also how much students I'm going to affect or, or benefit with a particular retrofitting. So I can take like broader um, dimensions into the decision making process. So for just as a summary for this Dominican Republic case, we did the same, the hazard exposure and the vulnerability. We obtained the risk results in the current conditions. We develop a risk the reduction strategy. And with this, we define how is the risk in the retrofitted conditions. Also, what is the human protection gap? And in here, what we presented is like a more broader approach in which we are not only interested in the infrastructure by itself, like in the structural engineering conditions, but also on, on how is the distribution of losses and how the humans' lives can be protected, which is one of the major objectives of, of the disaster risk reduction. Just to end, I, will, I want to state some limitations. The first one is that the output quality depends on the input quality. So what we see uh, in this presentation was at the beginning the methodology, then two case studies. And in each one of the case studies, we need to realize that uh, the, the quality of the data was the, um, well, depends directly or generates directly the, the quality of the output. In other terms, um, there's a famous phrase that is uh, that, that says that garbage in, garbage out. So in this case, if I include something bad into a project, if I don't know how the infrastructure 
uh, behaves, how it's characterized, well, the results will not be reliable. So it's very important to understand and to have this in mind. Also, this is a probabilistic process in which the uncertainty shall be considered in all, in all the steps. Uh, and therefore, if we are considering the uncertainty in each step, we should also consider this uncertainty on the results. And it is important to notice that these um, results are a tool for decision making and they are not a prediction with a risk assessment. It's not possible to define in three years an uh, earthquake of these particular characteristics will generate that level of losses. That's not the idea. What we wanted to do with this is to obtain data and to use this as a tool for decision making. And in particular, in this case, a tool for disaster risk reduction in a broader framework of, of disaster risk management. As, as, as a general conclusion, now to end this presentation, uh, the first one is that quality of a school infrastructure is a barrier for quality education, as, as Dina mentioned at the beginning. Also, we have seen in several examples that a school infrastructure have demonstrated to be highly vulnerable to natural disasters, to natural hazards, sorry. And also it's very important to mention that the, that the occupants of these buildings are more vulnerable than the occupants of other type of buildings, which also needs to be taken into account. We saw that probabilistic risk assessment can be an essential tool for the development of disaster risk reduction strategies. And it is very important to include the uncertainty in each one of these steps. There are several ways also to use this data and to interpret and exploit the data, the, the data derived from this probabilistic risk assessment. So it is important to understand that this is not a recipe in which you go like a particular number of steps and you always do the same. It depends very much in the context uh, that you are analyzing and you need to understand it to define, for example, uh, that kind of characteristics such as the acceptable risk and how this should be managed. Um, it is very important also to notice that the information generated with this probabilistic risk assessment can also be used for other applications in disaster risk management, such as risk transfers or early warning systems or emergency plans, amongst other, among others. And one final message that I want to emphasize is that risk is not equal to disasters. So what, what, what I want to specify with this is that even though we can find with this type of analysis a very high level of, of risk, this is not equal to in this, in this particular case study will happen several disasters. So risk can be managed, can be reduced and shall be managed and shall be reduced. Finally, uh, there are many work to do in this field. For example, we can include uh, several or other disciplines techniques, for example, machine learning, optimization, or decision theory, or Bayesian algorithms into this process to make them each one of the steps more reliable. It is very important also to try to understand how the intervention should be prioritized when they address different type of hazards. For example, we can say that if the risk is greater for one or the other, I should prioritize that, but we have different types of, of of hazard characteristics, for example, a hurricane can be in, in, in some way predicted its trajectory, so we can prepare for that. And in, in contraposition, the earthquake will happen from one moment to another, so that should be taken into account. And finally, if I'm going to retrofit a building, we need also to, to identify that the school facilities need to be more functional for the educational purpose, purposes. So, and we can also integrate into this process functional interventions such as lighting, ventilation, or wash condition, for example, improving the bathrooms conditions or, re or, or building more bathrooms. And these can be included into a decision framework to improve the infrastructure, which is the topic that I am working in my PhD thesis. And finally, all these uh, questions and all this process is, uh, as Dina mentioned in the beginning, is addressed by the UNESCO chair, by each one of the partners in different projects. And you can find also, you can find more information on the webpage that I am showing in this slide. 
So thank you very much all for connecting and, and for joining us. And now I will uh, give the world to Dino first and then um, to Dexter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rafael. Professor Dina, we'd like to say something for the reactors. Um, Professor Dina, can you hear us? Did you did you hear the? Dexter? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Rafael. Yes, perfect. Uh, please, please go ahead um, with the with the panel with the discussion okay. panel. Dexter, thank you. Thank you, Rafael and Professor Juan, for the brilliant presentations. I'm sure there's a lot of things going on, running in the mind of our participants, and they're excited to use Capra. But before we entertain questions from the general audience, we have invited um, distinguished experts from four countries tonight to give their uh, reactions to the presentations. So our first reactor is the executive director of the Philippine Council for Industry, Energy, and Emerging Technology Research and Development of the Department of Science and Technology. He spearheads the DREAM program, which developed and deployed technologies to provide necessary information, early warning, and advisory to communities at risk using airborne LIDAR technology and numerical simulation. He got his Doctor of Engineering at the Tokyo Institute of Technology, and he's also a professor at the Department of Geodetic Engineering at the University of the Philippines. May I call on Dr. Enrico Eric Paringet. Dr. Eric. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dexter, for uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I'd like to greet uh, everyone. Uh, well, a pleasant evening where I come from, and um, uh, oh, oh, Professor Dexter. But to the rest, I guess uh, uh, I want to greet everyone a good day. Uh, first off, I'd, uh, of course, I'd like to congratulate the Capra team for coming up with a very uh, uh, timely, relevant, and uh, useful uh, tool that. Uh, the community uh, on uh, disaster risk uh, reduction and management uh, can use. No? Um, from experience, I can see that uh, this is a stark um, um, improvement no? from, from the ways and things that uh, we're doing uh, from uh, way back when we started to pursue this uh, dream of uh, having a uh, probabilistic-based uh, uh, risk assessment. Uh, particularly for uh, damage and losses that will be caused by uh, uh, various uh, hazard uh, events uh, and the likely or uh, well likely or um, um, as a likely of course consequence of uh, different uh, uh, hazard events. Um, I see that uh, this will be a uh, useful not only useful not only for those that are in the uh, practice and field, uh, those that are into planning. Uh, those that will manage and uh, locate um, various uh, infrastructure, um, housing, and various uh, facilities that will be uh, useful to communities. Uh, second, this will be useful also for those that are in the, 
in design of uh, infrastructure as well as uh, facilities for making sure that um, uh, that uh, whatever structures that will be built may, may, they, uh, may they be schools as uh, was uh, exemplified in this uh, previous uh, presentation or hospitals or um, um, government facilities or even uh, of course uh, buildings that will be of course uh, uh, built by the uh, by um, those in the private sector or even your our humble uh, humble uh, abode humble house will uh, find the uh, solace that these kinds of assessment tools will be uh, useful uh, i'd like to react on a few points on uh, how this could uh, be uh, of course uh, be practically applied or practically uh, uh, deployed when it comes to um, well operational uh, application uh, the first is of course the first concern is of course the um, the skills of applicability of the method i can see that uh, this requires an enormous uh, amount or uh, amount of uh, data particularly on the um, typology of uh, each and every building that uh, will need to be inventory if the purpose is to actually uh, determine the uh, risks um, uh, involved in uh, or yeah risks involved for a particular area number two uh, is the amount the availability of uh, hazard maps i understand that uh, uh, it requires not only the uh, intensity at which these hazards uh, may, occur, may occur but also the frequency by which uh, they will happen and uh, of course the example might uh, have uh, particularly emphasize its use no for for earthquakes no but uh, of course like in in places such as the philippines we are actually prone to different types of uh, hazards for earthquakes alone there are various manifestations by which uh, this could this could actually damage buildings it could be damaged from shaking it could be damaged from liquefaction it could be damaged from tsunami it could be damaged from earthquake induced uh, landslides so that's uh, landslides alone you add the Typhoons, you could have damage from uh, wind, you could have damage from flood, uh, you could also have damage from uh, landslides uh, caused by uh, uh, rainfall. So uh, as you can see, um, the amount of uh, information or uh, data uh, requirements could actually also be overwhelming. And of course, that leads to the, the that, that my, my point about having to realize or having to put out an idea of how soon or how urgent will this kind of uh, data gathering be uh, uh, be involved if you're going to apply it in one particular area? Uh, I think we also need to have that kind of uh, of of um, timeline or uh, an idea of the deployment time for getting all kinds of data. And I uh, already uh, mentioned earlier about its uh, applicability to different types of. Uh, hazards because uh, for each you would need uh, different vulnerability curves for each type of structure so the curves will also vary according to the type of hazard and equivalently the uh, the, the degree of dam the uh, degree of uh, frequency will vary to, with each type of uh, hazard uh, occurrences so that said uh, i express my lot uh, my congratulations again to the team for coming up with this um, uh, tool and uh, we hope that, uh, uh, that this will actually not be the end of the development of this uh, uh, of, of CAPRA, but rather this will actually be a continuing effort among those that are in this community to, uh, to partake in and uh, in fact uh, celebrate no? because uh, we wanted to have a tool for everyone to, uh, to, to use and uh, share. Uh, with that, uh, I end my uh, reaction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc Eric. Thank you very much for your input. Very well appreciated. I now proceed immediately to our next uh, reactor. Um, he's the Disaster Risk Management and Learning Infrastructure Specialist at World Bank, Latin America and Caribbean region. Through the Global Program for Safe First School, his team aims to boost large-scale investments to improve the safety and resilience of school infrastructures at risk from natural hazards and to continue the learning environments for children. 
He also teaches at the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Piura in Peru. Please uh, let us listen to Professor Juan Carlos Atoche. Professor. Thank you, Dexter and team. Um, my main reaction is on how we can use this disaster risk knowledge to inform public policy design. Evidence and experience suggest that public reforms should be result oriented. This is an effective way to deliver value. There are three main aspects of this approach that can be informed by disaster risk analytics. The causal theory, which supports the policy, the definition of the public problem, and the feasibility of policy implementation. I will elaborate on the first one. We should connect disaster risk, safety, and learning through a comprehensive causal theory. This theory is required to underpin policies strategic objectives. If we interview an education policymaker, their priorities will be to increase human capital, reducing learning gaps, and to guarantee safety of students and teachers. Most of the time we work with disasters which produce deaths and injuries. For those disasters, the causal theory connects risk and safety in a simple way. But what happens if disasters affect both the learning process and the safety? Or what happens in countries with minor safety issues, but huge learning gaps? In the bank, we are preparing a technical assistance in a country which doesn't face earthquakes or hurricanes. In this country, floods are more challenging but government can manage very well. However, extreme temp temperature and humidity produced by climate change are big issues because of its negative impact on learning outcomes. The question is, which parameters should be included to formulate a comprehensive causal theory? We can get some inspiration from COVID-19. The pandemic highlighted the role of school facilities in the learning crisis. The more time the physical spaces were closed, the more losses were expected in terms of learning and future income. UNESCO, World Bank, and UNICEF produced research which conclude that this generation of students are in risk of losing $17 trillion in lifetime earnings. This is about 14% of today's global GDP. Other key measure is learning poverty. It means being unable to read and understand an, a short and simple text by age 10. Before the pandemic, in low and middle income countries, the share of children living in learning poverty was already 53%. With the pandemic, it could potentially reach 70%, given the long school closures and the ineffectiveness of remote learning. And finally, research conclude that physical conditions of indoor spaces have to be improved in order to reduce contagion risk, air quality, occupancy, and hygiene. Connecting those five parameters, school closures, learning poverty, lifetime earnings, physical conditions, and contagion risk, global institutions formulated a strong causal theory, which is used by governments to design effective policies and strategic investments. Thank you, Professor Juan. Thank you Thank very you, much. Sir. Let us proceed to our third uh, guest. Um, he is the Deputy Executive Director of NSET Nepal. He has several years of experience working in collaboration with the national and local governments for DRR and capacity building, uh, training focusing on seismic risk. He has a PhD in earthquake engineering from Tokyo University in Japan. May I call on Dr. Ramesh where again? Dr. Ramesh. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dexter. Uh, thanks a lot to the UNESCO chair for organizing such a wonderful event. And also I would like to congratulate both the Professor Francisco and also Mr. Fernandez for very excellent uh, presentations. Uh, we are two persons from NSET, and I'll focus slightly more on the CAPRA platform 
and then Naren talks slightly more on the schools uh, part uh, later. Uh, we have been using different risk assessment platforms here, including Capra that we learned quite, you know, I think in 2009, and then we used at that time for some of the cities in Nepal. And then we are we are also used several other uh, tools, the OpenQuake, uh, you know, the uh, even very simple, the Radius one developed by uh, UNISDR quite long ago. So the large range of the risk assessment tools that we use. To our understanding and lessons, uh, there are some of the parameters which are very important on which tools are more useful and helpful for the cities uh, to you know, increase the, or to help increase the awareness as well as to plan for the risk reductions and preparedness uh, planning as well. And the first of all, you know, it has to have the uh, possibility of multiple hazards analysis. The second one is definitely, you know, the, uh, uh, the provision of the detailed input and output. Of course, the accuracy depends on how much is the understanding as well as the, what is the level of accuracy of the inputs, but the provision of what level of the detail we can uh, use in the platform is very important uh, parameter. The third one is the expertise required. Some of the tools require very highly skilled people, which may not be available in all the cities, especially in the low and middle income uh, countries and the different cities. The simplicity in terms of using the platform itself, uh, you know, not only the technical easiness or difficulty, but how easy it is the, in terms of the interface to use it. Uh, is it good for the uh, use in the city level or is it also good for the use at the national level? That's also very important. What level uh, of the, you know, the, the geographical coverage uh, we can do. And then how easy it is to customize uh, to, uh, uh, include you know the uh, the local parameters. So considering all these, Capra is one of the excellent tool to our uh, uh, you know the uh, understanding because it has the provision of detail input and output and also multiple hazards and others. Uh, only one uh, you know the difficulty is you know the we need really very detailed information. So if the purpose is only for the awareness raising and general risk assessment then you know the other tools may be better in that sense but if we are really going to do a detailed assessments capra is one of the good platform to our understanding and also you know the uh, the all the manuals and tutorials i had not checked for some years now earlier most of those were only in the spanish but now i found that most of those are in english as well so it's one of the good tools uh, thank you very much so this is uh, in brief my comments thank you thank very you. much dr ramesh our other reactor is the director of School Earthquake Safety Program Wing of the NSET Nepal. Um, has experience in working as a manager in school projects in Nepal related to data collection, seismic vulnerability assessment, and retrofitting. Has a PhD in geotechnical engineering from Ehime University in Japan. Dr. Marisini. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Dexter. Uh, thank you very much, UNESCO Chair, for this opportunity and uh, all the presenters who presented wonderful work uh, around the world. It is the great uh, <clears throat> learning as well to me. So uh, also I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Ramesh uh, because he made my life easy to comment with most of the technical things he already mentioned. Um, here in brief, I want to um, uh, highlight the, uh, from the uh, Nepal experience because school uh, resilience on the disaster means not only the functional and uh, physical uh, infrastructure, the system disaster management system established in the schools is also matters a lot. And another, uh, as the professor Juan uh, Carlos mentioned about the pandemic uh, effect, only the school environment resiliency doesn't work well as the pandemic, uh, pandemic um, <clears throat> shows that the um, um, lower income countries uh, students cannot continue their learning during the pandemic because they are outside the <clears throat> schools and they don't have the facility, whatever the um, 
um, um, virtual uh, platform gives the opportunity to continue their learning. That means the community resilience also matter a lot. So uh, I think in, in the future, uh, we need to um, um, distinguishly need to be uh, categorized how the uh, physical infrastructure and the functional um, uh, um, um, functional of the schools um, gives the enable environment for the learning and uh, how much the percentage it contribute uh, from the um, um, disaster risk management system established in the schools and how much the their associate, um, uh, associated community uh, resiliency um, uh, uh, matters on the overall risk on the quality education and the uh, education learning. I think these two parameters is still we are missing to, to um, um, assess the risk um, um, due to the um, uh, preparedness. Uh, especially the disaster management can, uh, system established in the school, as well as the resiliency of their community. So these two parameters need to be, uh, uh, should be an integral part of our probability risk assessment uh, in future, so that the holistically we can cover all the three pillars of the comprehensive school safety uh, framework. That is the global campaign we are um, adopting um, uh, throughout the world. So uh, I would like to come, uh, conclude my comment. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dr. Marasini. And now um, our last reactor from uh, Europe. No, so she's the chairholder assistant of the UNESCO Chair on Intersectoral Safety for Disaster Risk Reduction and Resilience at the University of Udine in Italy. Her activities focus on development and promotion of an integrated system of research, training, implementation, and information on intersectoral safety for DRR and resilience, also within the school safety comprehensive framework. May I call on Dr. Petra Malisa? Dr. Petra. Thank you, Thank you very much. And I add my compliments to this uh, great uh, initiative. Uh, and it was a really a pleasure to participate. And uh, I'm honored to give you my comments and reactions that derive mainly from my experience uh, in the school safety programs and projects that we developed as UNESCO chair uh, all around the world. First of all, um, the risk analysis you, you, you showed is a very important step for territorial uh, strategies definition. So it's a very useful tool for supporting decision makers. And uh, the approach is excellent for the analysis at the territorial level, and it permits to identify and address uh, the main issues for decision making and for uh, supporting the definition of strategies for safety, improving of risk reduction mitigation. Uh, I have some, some comments that are from my experience uh, saying that the uh, aspects underlying is that uh, it's important to uh, assess the structural behavior of buildings as a first main uh, important aspect for the, for the risk mitigation, but also as you show in the videos in your presentation also, it would be interesting if we can also develop a a risk analysis methodology that considers also non-structural elements, non-structural issues that could affect uh, so many children in schools uh, and these are most of uh, most important aspects. Uh, other important aspect is how to support the decision makers in taking the decision using the results you, you give to them, considering also the, the variation of the results that um, it was previously presented in in all the, the in, in the presentations. So also to understand how the results reflect the variation, for example, of the inside the, the vulnerability curves used for the assessment. Um, Another question uh, that I have and that I arise is uh, the multi hazard approach. Since in, in your presentation, you, you discussed, for example, about uh, mainly about uh, seismic hazard, but you highlighted the problem of also having a strong wind hazard that could affect the, um, the schools. An example is in Haiti, as you know, after uh, the earthquake of 2010, many school collapses because they had very heavy roof 
schools. Uh, and after the earthquake, uh, most of schools were reconstructed using very light roof. So in order to uh, have lighter structures. But in 2016, the Hurricane Matthew completely destroyed and touched these very light roofs that were not uh, rebuilt considering a multi-hazard perspective, but only considering the seismic hazard. So it's important for, uh, for ensuring, for uh, reducing the risk in a multi-hazard perspective uh, to consider jointly, not only one hazard uh, each time, but to consider them at the same time, providing also retrofitting intervention that are suitable for all the um, for all the other that could affect the schools. For example, very simple, it can be uh, rise all buildings in case of flooding, but this could create uh, uh, soft floors that could, in case of earthquake, uh, call, um, induce the collapse of buildings. So uh, these are my comments, and again, very much compliments for uh, this initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Petra. Um, uh, Doc Dina, uh, Professor Dina, we can now entertain questions to the, from the general audience, if that's okay. Uh, Rafael and Professor Juan, dear, I think. Yes. yes, dear Dexter, yes. yes. If you There's a related question uh, raised by Dr. Petra from uh, Julia Prami, I think uh, she's still here from the British Geological Survey. She was asking, um, is, is it possible to analyze potential compounding impacts from the multiple related and unrelated hazard. So maybe Rafael or Professor yes. Juan. Okay, yes. okay, maybe I'll answer. Yes, uh, we, uh, during yes. the work that Rafael has shown, for instance, and using the Capra platform, we looked at the, uh, the hazards and the risk that each of the independent hazards have could produce on the same set of schools. And this answers, uh, for instance, uh, part of Petra questions. Uh, if we tried to understand for the same building, what are the type of retrofit or the type of improvement at structural level, which will address weaknesses for different type of hazards. In order to answer Julia's uh, questions, um, more recently, with uh, um, other studies that we have carried out here at UCL, we have looked, for instance, at the compounded effect of repeated flooding in Assam uh, when then these interact with uh, earthquake hazards. Assam is a region in the north of India, not very far from Nepal, and it's uh, affected by very high earthquake uh, caused by the, uh, in the Himalayan uh, uh, region, plus it uh, uh, lays in the Brahmaputra uh, areas and therefore it's also affected by monsoon every year, but also by uh, recurrent flooding. Um, up to uh, one uh, meters or more. And with climate change, these uh, events are increasing both in numbers and in magnitude. So we are actually been looking at not only the effect on the buildings uh, in terms of the, of the uh, deterioration of the materials and therefore the effect that that deterioration has on the material resilience to earthquake, and on the structural resilience to earthquake, but also the effect that the two combined hazard might have on the general educational disruptions uh, in terms of the time that the students are going to be away from uh, um, the uh, classroom. And uh, um, Narayin was saying how important it is, and also uh, uh, one uh, uh, Carlos uh, Atoche were saying how important it is to, for the student to be in the class in order to uh, not uh, have uh, education poverty. So yes, we are looking at this and indeed, uh, the paper on this particular issue has just been published on the uh, International Journal of Disaster Risk Reduction, and please have a look at it. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Dina. You have three minutes, but I think we have can accommodate two questions. This one's from Miguel. Have any of these results been cross-validated with post-disaster data? 
what can be said about the accuracy of the PML curve or the relative loss? Have ever any insurance program been sufficient for disaster that actually happened? Rafael, I will leave the seat to Rafael to answer yes, this specific yes, question. Thank you, Dina, and thank you, Dexter, and thank you, Miguel, also for, uh, for the question. I think that's very important. Uh, at the end, uh, there have been some studies that have correlated the results from this risk assessment with historical data of losses, but there are many particularities that should be taken into account in the process. The first one is that we may have not experienced an event as dangerous as it could happen in the future. So it is important not to only like a, a stay with the historical data because some sources may have the potential to generate greater earthquakes than the one that we have in records. And also a second, a second a consideration that is very important to, to take into account is that the losses are not quantified in the same way in different countries, for example, and have not been uh, systematic, like systematically um, zoomed. So we, for example, can find some losses in database such as MDAT, for example, in which they, for particular events, uh, try to quantify the losses, but for others, they do uh, in a different matter uh, in some others. A type of hazard, for example, they do not quantify the economic losses or other type of losses. So that's a challenging process. It has, has been done, but, but it's important to take into account those two considerations. Okay. Thank you. I think we got one minute. And at this point, I'd like to thank our reactors. Thank you very much for your inputs and to those who ask questions. I'm now giving back the floor to you, Rafael, or Professor Dina. Thank you. Yes, sorry, we have one camera on over two laptops, so that's why you can see this uh, uh, sort of exchange. Um, so um, we we really want to conclude uh, very quickly in uh, uh, the time that in the more, less than one minute that we have left. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, uh, Juan Francisco Correal and Rafael Fernandez for their very interesting and in-depth in presentation. I will also like to thank you very much, uh, Dexter, for uh, mon moderating the discussion and our reactors. Uh, they were, they really had expanded the uh, single point of view or the, the point of view that we were trying to bring across with this initial um, course. But also I really want to uh, thank our audience. It was, this is, has been very well attended from country as far as Rwanda, Libya and Ecuador, so and the Philippines, so across the globe really. And uh, we are looking forward to deliver many more of these events. I remind you that uh, we, are, we are asking you to fill in a, a, a short survey. There should be a link in the chat. Please do so and uh, let us know what you think. The only other piece of information is that we have been recording this uh, presentation and course, and it will be available on our uh, website uh, at the same link where you have found information on the course. And I've also shared that link in the chat again. So thank you all again very much for listening and thank you all for participating. And we look forward to many more of these uh, um, encounters, uh, possibly one every couple of months. Thank you. Thank you very much for watching.